I'm a children's book writer and I'm a student of Laura Siegel's. I encountered Laura uh, before I ever met her uh, in college when um, I came across this book, Gallows Songs, um, which she translated poems by Christian Morgenstern. Can I interrupt you right now and say yes. that I was only a co translator with the poet W.D. Snodgrass? I, yes. Um, when did you realize that um, writing was your work and uh, that it was your job to be a writer? Well, the interesting thing is that I was a writing before I uh, knew the word being a writer. Uh, I came to uh, England as a refugee child at the age of 10, or as I put it, at half past 10. Uh, and uh, I came to live with a foster family in Liverpool. And it, they, and it seemed to me, from the questions they were asking me, that they didn't really understand uh, what had just happened in Austria and under Hitler, where I came from. So I asked for what in England is called a copy book, which is one of as I mean, they were purple a, 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 a books, little books with lined paper with a red red rimmed lay, white label, and I think 36 pages. And I began to write what had happened in Vienna in that year after Hitler. And it's a terrible, I mean, from every kind of point of view, it's a terrible piece of writing. I had the feeling that one has as a writer throughout life that I wasn't getting it right. So I put in uh, thunderstorms and dawns and sunsets. Uh, I event, then my foster, my youngest foster sister, Ruth, had this little book translated into English. And from then on, I began to write socialist stories about the poor and all kinds of very sentimental things. Fast forward, I'm 10, fast forward three years. It's now war, and uh, my mother has had to move away from within that mileage of the channel that. Uh, German-speaking enemy aliens who, who were not a, allowed to live in. And we had come to Guildford, um, where we were going to live for the next several years. And I remember a room at the head of a very steep stair, and I was throwing up. And between throwing up, my mother was reading me David Copperfield. <laughs> and the light burst. I thought, that's what I want to do. I want to be a writer. So I had barely been writing for three years, badly, horribly, until the notion of being a writer had come to me by hearing David Copperfield. And when did you realize that you could do this as work and make a living at it? I, I never found that out. <laughs> I found it out to this day. <laughs> but there is another little piece of it. There comes a time somewhere in your 20s, I think I'm not at all alone in this, where it occurs to you that you are a writer with nothing to write about. You haven't died, you haven't been in love, none of these large things have happened to you, you have no story. And though I knew I had these refugee stories, I had a sense that everybody already knew them. Until I went to a party somewhere in New York, I went to the I went to the New School to do to take to take classes in creative writing, or to meet people. This was the other thing, the other writers, the dream of the other writers. So we had a party, and somebody said, "How did you get to the United States?" And I began to tell one of my stories, and the room listened. Aha! <laughs> this is it. I do have a story. I'm going to tell him people are going to listen. <laughs> so at age 10, in a sense, you had this mission to get your parents back from, to save your parents from, from Hitler's Ooh. Germany. And in a sense, that was a writing assignment because the letters, you to write letters. I just want to say, all of us children, almost all the children that I met, 
thought they were doing, getting their parents out to do something. But it's true that I began to write. In, uh, they put us into, a, into a, a camp. It was really a worker summer camp that they opened up on this bitter, bitter, bitter cold winter. And we, we were distributed into these little cottages, three or four children with, with one, of the, one older person, or older child to take care of us. And I began to write letters. I think I addressed them to my cousins, Dante Anna and Uncle Ernst, who had already come to, to London. And I hoped that they were going to bring my parents out and do something. And I remember that I treated this project of getting my parents out as a piece of writing, because I remember thinking, oh, that's good. You know, I, for instance, it was, there was a, a, in the back of the, of, the, uh, of the cottage, there were a couple of roses left over from summer, these decrepit looking little roses with a little cup of snow on top. And, uh, and I used these as my subject. If, if nobody, if nobody uh, rescues my parents, they will be like this. Mm. And I said, oh, that's good. Right. <laughs> oh, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny that in these extreme, in these critical circumstances, the notion of writing a good sentence or having a good metaphor was already quite vivid in my mind <laughs> and important in my mind. That's reminding me of your short story that was recently po uh, published about Noah's daughter. Oh, <laughs> in which she also feels a great responsibility to write the correct or compose the correct yeah. message and to like save he, others. He keeps rewriting and re-editing so long that by the time, well, she actually never gets it perfect, so she never gets a message to God, which is, please don't do this. <laughs> it's a bad idea. Speaking she wants, which, she yeah. wants to tell him, listen, really, even if you drown everybody, afterwards we're not going to be nicer or less violent or less like mm -hmm. some people we know now. Sadly. Don't, don't, <laughs> yeah. don't do it. It's not a good idea, but she never gets, it, gets the message to him because she's still perfecting the sentence. <laughs> Publishers sit next to me sometimes when I'm doing a reading. And I said, I've got my book here, and my editor, Valerie, will look over and say, but you, you're writing, I'm still, and before I read it, I'm still editing, and like Noah's daughter. And can you show me a copy of this analysis yes. that you've read, and, yeah. and, uh, and the, the published book is marked up with... with there's, a, there's a wonderful changes. story of, of Henry James, a character in Henry James, uh, doing that, having a published book, and he's still getting it right. <laughs> or in Camus, isn't it, the, 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 uh, in, in The Stranger, isn't it, the guy who imagines this one sentence and keeps working on it over and over again because he wants people to rise and take their hats off? <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember. Yeah, that's, that's exactly. He that's reads the, the That's the idea. <laughs> that's the hope. Yeah. yeah. Well, you said that you rewrite uh, not to pretty it up, but to find out what you're thinking, what you're talking about. And to get it absolutely, absolutely. My, it's not, it may not be true, but I believe that I don't, it doesn't mean what it's supposed to mean until the perfect, the word is in the right place and the comma is in the right place. Mm -hmm. It's an exaggeration, but it's, it, that's the principle of writing. You 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 uh, you you're not making it pretty. You're making it right. I'm I'm not a good inventor of anything, but once I've got something down, I love this process of getting it right. Mm -hmm. I enjoy it. It's a pleasure. It's what I want to do, and the idea of starting something new is is painful and difficult. And frustrating. How about translation? What uh, is what? that? Um, a similar process. Okay. Well, isn't it fast? Yeah. Uh, that's the, I love doing that because yeah. you're doing you 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 are relieved of the idea of creating, of doing the difficult thing. What you're doing is getting it right mm -hmm. in, in a new language. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm yeah. I'm glad you brought that up. That is, 
Can you talk a little bit about uh, the juniper tree and the process of uh, how you came into translating? It was my, my editor, Michael DiCaprio at Fire Strauss, he had uh, done, I, I forget which the order of things, but uh, uh, he had uh, been the editor on Thelma Mitzi and also on Lucinella. And he had this notion of bringing Maurice Sendak, who had always wanted to illustrate the, uh, the, the grim fairy tales. And I had always wanted to translate them into modern English. This is no longer such a case. It's been, it, more people have done it. Uh, um, if, I, if I could remember the, 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 this is the point where I can't remember the name. But other people have done this. But my notion was that you take it out of its uh, Victorian uh, uh, English where girls are maidens and uh, the language is stilted or it is really a dress up fairy tale language which is charming I find it charming now at the time when I was doing this I thought it was <laughs> and I was going to translate it into modern English I have also I'm, with, I'm almost embarrassed to say done the same thing to the Bible I have been allowed to translate Bible narratives and into modern English in the, in the, same, in the same way. Um, uh, but it's, it, to do uh, the Grimm's is interesting because in, in Grimm there are many, uh, many uh, Id idiomatic and uh, uh, sayings, old sayings, which don't exist in English. So it's fun to create a new old saying in English. Do you have a favorite of the tales? Of oh, the, the Juniper tree, no question. Mm. It is the most terrible of the uh, stepmothers. She, uh, let me just say, I've just finished writing an essay about the Grimm's. I've had the notes uh, forever, and I just found the notes, and I've just, just actually just written it. It's called "My Mother the Witch, My Father the Wimp," <laughs> because it's a, really about the horrible mothers and the fathers who don't interfere for for interesting reasons in their being. I mean, they don't stop them. Mm -hmm. The question is, where are the fathers? While the mother, for instance, in the juniper tree invites her little stepson to take an apple, it says a red apple, a black red apple, a red apple, out of the chest. And when he's in there, she closes the lid. Mm. So his head rolls among the red apples. And then she cuts him up and puts him in the stew pot. And little sister Anne-Marie weeping salt tears into it, salt it. And then the father comes, who has been away, right? The father's always away, they're hunting, <laughs> or they're on a journey, this one is just away. And he comes back and he says, where's my son? And the mother brings the black, black stew. Uh, black pudding is famously a blood pudding. Mm -hmm. not, not, not human blood, but lamb blood. So he, she gives it to him and he says, Oh, this is so good. Give me more. None of you are supposed to eat any of this. I'm going to eat this all up. And he eats it all up and throws the bones under the table. And little Anne-Marie, the sister, gathers them in a silken top and puts them under the juniper tree. The juniper tree where the mother prayed and prayed for a child, the kind of child that is as red as blood and white, snow and black as, as wood, ebony, mm -hmm. that kind of child. Uh -huh. <laughs> and then the little, oh, I'll, say, I'll tell you the little, uh, there's a little uh, song that the bird sings. My mother, she butchered me, my father, he ate me. My sister, little Anne-Marie, she gathered up the bones of me and put, tied them in a silken cloth. Twee, twee, what a pretty bird am I. And the little bird flies away. 
he becomes the instrument of justice and he brings back presence. I, uh, I always think this is a mistake, that the father should get any present, but he gets, <laughs> he gets a, gold, a gold bracelet or something. And Marie gets shoes, red shoes, mm -hmm. and a mother. You have to have this wonderful moment where the bird brings back a millstone. You know what a millstone is? Within the story, we already have a picture of it needing 20 young men to get the millstone up. And then the bird, the bird of the bird puts it around his, his neck and flies back and squashes the mother. <laughs> and the last words, I'm not sure that I can say them probably, something like, and there was steam and flames, and the little boy stood there, and he took Anne-Marie and his father by the hand, and they were so happy, and went in and had